The heart of this story is what happened after the greatest display of God in Elijah's life in front of the prophets of Baal. What happened to Elijah? <coughs> he tumbled into the greatest depression of his life. That's what 19 is. 19 is depression a la exhaustion. It's the day after Billy Graham spoke to the 25,000. It's how Billy felt on the next morning. It's what I would call the pastor's Monday morning syndrome. And in chapter 19, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. You killed all my prophets. You're dead. You're dead. By tomorrow, you're dead. So, Elijah, who has gone through provision 101, 201, 301, Ministry, four great times of ministry, seen God bring down fire from heaven. You got to be saying, man, Elijah, your ministry's on fire, literally. And what happens? Look at what he did in verse 3. He was afraid. Circle it, identify it, and understand that fear is one of the great attack points and discouragement often comes from fear. And it says, he was afraid, so he rose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba. Boy, that is a run. That's three days. I mean, he's just, he's booking his way down, getting out of there. And it belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. Then he wasn't even done. Just in case anybody even recognized him all the way down three days away in Beersheba, he went another day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. You know where he was? He was in the neighborhood of the northern Sinai, in the desert of Sinai. He was near the place of Kadesh, the place where Moses had talked to God before. And there he is out in the middle of the wilderness under a juniper tree. This is a wilderness shrub. The juniper tree is, is large enough to offer shade, uh, shade, but it isn't shade. It's large enough to offer shade, but it is not a tree. It's a bush. He's sitting under a bush in a hot desert, having run for at least four days away from the queen. And it says, um, God, I, I just want to die. Just take my life. I'm not better than my father's. Worn nerves, exhaustion, emotional depression after a great moment with God are not because you're no longer walking with God. It's because you're walking with God in a human body. So look at what God tells him to do. He says, stay up all night and pray with me, brother. No. He says, here's what I want you to do. Elijah, Lay down and go to sleep. Wake up, Elijah. Here's some food. Eat. Go back to sleep. W wait, wake up. Eat. Take another nap. You know what's so good about this? What's so good is that what the angel of the Lord told him to do was shut up and get some rest and get some food. Why is that important? Because behavioral depression that comes from exhaustion should be answered by sleep and food, not long times of prayer. Don't beat yourself. Don't climb stairs with shorts on so that your knees become bloody. Don't cry out to the Lord for every sin you've ever done in your life because you're going to feel like you're a sinner. You're going to feel, feel like a thousand pounds of sin on a popsicle stick. You're going to feel miserable because you're exhausted. Now, here's what I need you to know. Even God says that some depression is physically motivated and needs to be physically solved. If you find yourself in a dark space and you can't figure out what it is, go to a doctor and have them stick a needle in you. Let him find what's wrong. You know why? I have known many people who have had chemical depressions. Uh, one particular person who's very close to me has a thyroid that doesn't work very well. 
They can walk in and get a thyroid medication and in 24 hours the cloud lifts, the darkness goes away and they are fine. Their kids don't all suddenly become beaming testimonies of light. Their bills don't evaporate, but life gets light again. Why? Because their thyroid doesn't work. Now, there are Christians out there that will go, well, you just need to lay out there and pray all night. That's not what Elijah was told to do. So he lays down, he goes to sleep. Angel touches him, arise and eat, verse 6. Uh, there was some uh, bake, a baked cake on hot stones, jar of water. He ate, he drank, he laid down again. Angel came a second time, touched him, rise, eat, rose, ate, drank. When the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the mountain of God. He wasn't ready to see God yet. He needed to sleep. He wasn't ready to meet God yet. He needed to get something to eat. Not everything is spiritual. You are physical. And you can get so caught up in the spiritual that you forget that sometimes what you need to, you didn't drink enough. There are people out there making everything spooky. Satan attacked me and I fainted. Did you drink anything today? You're dehydrated. Satan didn't need to get out of bed to do that. You did that. Look, if you don't put oil in your car, Satan didn't break it. You did. He doesn't have to work so hard when you're being so stupid. So, now, he's, he drank, he ate, verse 9. Then he came to a cave, and now he's in the Mount Sinai. He's where God had met Moses. He's in a very important place. How many of you think maybe he walked up that hill and up onto that mountain with maybe a, a breath of prayer? You're back on Mount Sinai. This is the heartbeat of the law. And you're a Jew. You don't go strolling on Mount Horeb. That's not what you do. He came there to a cave, and he took up a lodging there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and I love this encounter. He said to him, Hey, Lige, what are you doing here? Now, just remember that God didn't ask a question that God didn't know the answer. So who's the question for? God will make you verbalize that which is in your heart so you can hear it. How many of you have had a really clear thought, then you verbalize it and you realize how stupid it was? Okay. God wants you to, you know why you pray? He already heard it in your heart. Why do you pray? So you can verbalize it because God likes to hear your voice. And sometimes you're going to realize how selfish you are while you're praying. It happened to me the other day. I was praying about something saying, Lord, I'm only doing this. And the Lord said, no, you're not. And I needed to hear it out loud, so I heard how stupid it sounded. Now, maybe this doesn't happen to you. Maybe you're so intelligent that every word that tumbleth from your mouth is just brilliant. Not me. Here's what it says. Elijah, on Elijah. Well, God, um, since you asked, can, can I just share with you, you know, God of the universe, why I'm really here? Here's, here's the reason. I have been very zealous for the Lord, uh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your commandment, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. No, you aren't. And they seek my life. <laughs> They're going to take it away. So he said, um, Elijah, go stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord was passing by. Ah, uh, this, this is right out of Gen uh, Exodus 32. This has happened before. God's walking by. God likes to take a stroll on Horeb occasionally. He likes to visit the earth. He walks around that mountain. And there he goes. A great strong wind was rending the mountain and whoosh, coming in behind it, breaking in pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord didn't show himself in the wind. The whole thing's rumbling. There's an earthquake. The Lord doesn't show himself in the earthquake. Whoosh! A fire comes down and there's cracks of lightning all around and the Lord's not showing himself in the fire. Then there's just a little breeze. When Elijah 
heard it. He wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood by the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? Second time God asks him a question, but this time God's got his attention. What was the sin of Elijah in his heart that was causing him to say, just kill me, God, that God just dealt with? He failed chapter 17. He thought that there was no provision of God that he was alone, last prophet, and God was not on the job paying attention. God who delivered bread by ravens, God who increased oil and flour for a widow, God who brought the widow's son back to life, was somehow on a break and had missed the fact that his altars were broken down, his people had forsaken him, and he just didn't get it. I'm the only one. No, 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 no. See, here's the thing. I can soar through here and use a simple blowing of a wind to break rocks. I can shatter the earth. I can terrorize the earth with fire from heaven. But I choose to be heard in a gentle voice, in a gentle blowing wind. You have not listened. You've looked for the bombastic and loud, but you've missed the gentle. You don't understand me. You've seen my profundity when I brought you bread from a raven, but you missed it when I did gentle, small, and quiet things. So now this is the lesson of sensitivity. He doesn't know that God doesn't have to be bombastic to be speaking. And so, what are you doing here? Second time, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek, to, seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hatziel king over Aram, and Yehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint of king over Israel, and Elisha, the son, uh, the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Not only do I have somebody, he's going to replace you. I've already got your replacement. Since you thought you were alone, you're not. I already have the next guy. Then it shall come about that the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Yehu, shall put to death, uh, Yehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Yehu, Elisha shall put to death. You, you were used to cut down the prophets of Baal. I'm going to put a sword in your, your uh, next guy's hand. The director that comes after you, he's going to have his own battle to fight. And yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You think you're alone? I got, it's either 3,500 with two knees apiece, or 7,000 and their knees. I can't tell. The Hebrew's the same. I got thousands. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean I don't have them. You do bombastic, but you don't do gentle wind. There's a lot of people out there serving me. You think you're the only one. You're not. I got a replacement for you. I got 7,000 down the line. Don't you think you're alone? Now, Elijah's not being smacked down. He's being instructed. So he departed from there. He found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him. He came upon his replacement, and his replacement wasn't like him. Elijah came from humble circumstances and ate bread and water by a stream. Elisha has the latest John Deere tractor with 12 oxen pulling it. In other words, Elisha's a rich kid. God is going to replace you, the lowly Elijah, with a rich kid. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah. And he said, please let me kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow you. And he said, go back again. For what have I done to you? Elijah doesn't like him. Elijah doesn't, didn't think there was a replacement and doesn't like the one God chose. And that's going to set our story after lunch.
It's a good story. It's a fun story. But what I want you to see is it's not an easy story. Verse 20 and 21, and then we'll stop. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father. Verse 21, he ran, he returned following, from following him, took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to people and they ate. And then he arose and he followed Elijah and he ministered to him. He served him is what it literally says. Doesn't mean he ministered him like, you know, brother, let me come and pray for you. He served him. He became a sir. He left his place of a rich kid and he blew up one of the tractors. And that's how little. This is called burning your bridges behind you. And then he goes out and he runs off. But I got to tell you, Elijah's not done his ministry. Remember, 1 Kings, Elijah, 2 Kings, Elisha. Elisha is going to have to spend some time scraping and serving before he's ready. Why? Because often in scripture, we get more about the training of the prophet than the work of the prophet. What does that tell you? God will tell you what your job is. What he's concerned about is what kind of person you've become. In the New Testament correlation, we know a lot about the character of an elder or deacon and almost nothing about what they do. Why? Because it's not important what they do if what they become is what they're supposed to be. Then they'll do what God tells them to do. But I really, really love that God gave us a, a kind of a, an intense view of Elijah. Now, one of the things I want you to take away from that is this simple lesson. Give yourself a break. You're not going to get it all right. And moments, God, in, in one moment, God's going to use you, and the next moment, you're going to feel like a, a, an absolute jerk. Maybe it's because you are. I don't know. But it might not be. It might be you're just worn out. Would you become not only more spiritually sensitive because of your work in the word, would you also become more sensitive to your own body? Do some of you have a rhythm where you know there's a certain time of day that is like the worst time to take on trouble? By observation, afternoons are not really your better time. <laughs> I'm just saying. Some of you are morning people. Some of you are evening people. I'm not seeing anybody I can identify as an afternoon people. Okay? It's fine with me. But what I'm saying is that you need to know your body. Some of you don't sleep enough, and it comes out in your spiritual life, and it comes out in your study of the Word. You don't sleep enough. You are not disciplining your body. Paul said, I make it my subject. I force my body to do what I want my body to do. Um, some of us are going to need to learn to do that. I do it with exercise. I do it with denials. I go through long, dry periods, or I go through long, you can't have this, this, or this. And it's not like the word of the Lord came unto Randy saying, you know. It's that I, I, I get to a certain place and I just say, Lord, I don't want any of those things to master me. I want to master those things. And so I just don't do them. It's the, during those times, if I say, Lord, I'm really just going to cut the sugar, everyone offers me sugar during those times. It is everywhere. And all of a sudden, people who never offer me anything, Pastor, can I give you this cake? No. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's really strange. I will tell you, you, but you have to get on top of your body. Sleep as you should. Eat as you should. Make sure that what you're putting in your body is what needs to be there because some of you are actually being spiritually defeated by physical causes. That's really what your problem is. Sometimes you need to stay up and pray. Lots of times you need to go to bed. 